to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to study in 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 through 7 tonight. Um, and uh, I didn't want to get into the, the last, from verse 8 to the end of the chapter, uh, is, is a single thought. So we'll push that off till next week, and we'll take a look at the first seven verses here tonight. So you can remain seated if you'd like, and follow along at the reading of God's Word, verses 1 through 7. Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house is not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he maketh it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man who shall touch them must be fenced with iron, and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. Father, thank you for uh, the scripture that you give to us tonight, for all of your scripture. We're so thankful and appreciative, and we stand in awe of your word. We respect it, and we accept it, and we submit ourselves to it. So, Father, as you teach us tonight, may we not only learn that which uh, you give to us by way of the principles found within your word, but, Father, of the the courage to apply them in our lives in the days ahead. We'll give you praise and thanks, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. I want to talk, this is um, David's last words. Uh, It says um, in the first phrase here, the first verse, now these are the last words of David. These are not, uh, this is not the last thing David said. That's found over in 1 Kings chapter 2. Um, But um, this is the last psalm that David wrote. There are at least 73 uh, psalms in the book of Psalms that David uh, has been attributed to David having written them. Uh, so this, uh, this is the last psalm that he wrote. In fact, it is a song uh, that we see here. Uh, it was written in the form of a song, these first uh, seven verses. So this is um, his last inspired psalm or song, if you will. Um, it's a literary piece of literary work, if you will. It's a poem, if you want to call it that as well. A lot of uh, music is written uh, as poetry and then uh, put the music and sung. Um, but this is the last one that he wrote. Um, uh, and it's not in the Psalms. It's here in the book of Second Samuel. But um, there's three things I want to talk about regarding this psalm. The first is, and I want to talk about David because that's what the, the psalm talks about. And we're going to talk some about other related aspects of that. But first is uh, David, the humble servant. David, the humble servant. And we'll see this in the first verse. Um, and uh, we'll review a little bit of the uh, passages that we've studied in the past as we go through this. We'll pen, spend a, a good portion of our time on this one verse. But it says, now these are the last words of David, meaning that David actually wrote it. Um, and remember, these last verses in uh, 2 Samuel, uh, excuse me, last chapters, chapters 21 to 24, are not written in chronological order, uh, but they are inserted uh, without respect to chronology in the book. But David here, it says, um, uh, and he characterizes himself in writing this, this uh, first stanza, if you will, He says, these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, uh, 
and the sweet psalmist of Israel said. So there's four things that he says about himself. First, he says he's the son of Jesse. Uh, Jesse was just, uh, an ord- in his family, were just an ordinary Jewish family. Jesse, in fact, was a farmer. Uh, uh, his wealth consisted of his herd of sheep, primarily. And although he no doubt had other animals as well, we know that he had sheep. And uh, if, we, uh, if we take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16, it's been some time since we've been there. Um, and I haven't gone back to check when we were there. But if you remember, and I'm not going to go there, but in Ruth chapter 4, it tells us that uh, Jesse, in fact, is the son of uh, Boaz and Ruth. And you may, may remember that, uh, being of the tribe of Judah, if you will. And, of course, his son, uh, one of his sons, the, el- the youngest of his sons, was David. And he was just a shepherd, right? But let's take a look at, the, um, at David's humble beginning, if you will. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 10, and this is after um, Samuel had been commissioned uh, to anoint uh, David as king. Samuel didn't know who was anointing a king, but he knew it was going to be one of the sons of Jesse. And so Jesse parades his sons in, and lo and behold, none of them are working. So in verse 10 of chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, it says, Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Now here's the interesting thing, uh, just as a a byword here, but Samuel didn't know how many sons Jesse had. Think about the faith of Samuel here. It it seems evident from the context that Jesse paraded all of his sons before Samuel, and Samuel was given an order by God to go anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. There appears to be none to anoint. I mean, look at it. It says in uh, verse 10 there, uh, excuse me, verse 11, after, after, after Samuel tells Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. But knowing that God has chosen a son of Jesse, none of these. It's all he knew about. For in, in verse 11, in the first part, it says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all thy children here? <laughs> Is this all of them? <laughs> and Jesse said this, and this sort of gives us a characterization, a characterization of David. And so Jesse says, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Oh, there is one more. It's almost like he forgot about him. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I do have one more. He's just out there keeping the sheep. The others seemingly had more important roles within the family, all of them being older. And we know that David was a fairly young man at this point in time. But he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. Uh, And behold, uh, behold here seems to suggest the insignificance of, uh, of David even to his father, having uh, eight sons. So it says here, Behold, he keepeth the sheep, and Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. We're not going to stop this search. Samuel was on a mission from God. And so in verse 12, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance. uh, And... And he was handsome, though goodly to look at means he was a very handsome man. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now I'll just simply say, verse 13, that just matter-of-factly Samuel anointed him. He didn't ask any questions. That's where we should be. But the fact that David did have a very humble beginning, because you see there that seemingly very insignificant even within his own family, when Samuel came to look for the king, Jesse didn't even consider him to be worthy of consideration, obviously, and, and didn't even bother uh, to bring him in, even though Samuel had requested that. Uh, so we see here, if you will, that he, that he seemed to be the least likely candidate for the job of king. Isn't that something? That's who David was. Even though he was identified as a man after God's own heart earlier in 1 Samuel, he was the least likely candidate for the job. Uh, And I wish I'd have taken this to heart more when the Lord was calling me into the ministry because I can't tell you how many times I argued with God and saying, 
there's somebody else out there that you want because I'm not the person. I'm the least likely candidate for the job you want done, Lord. And I did. I, I argued that year after year for three years. So um, he seemed to be fairly incapable. Look at uh, chapter 17 in 1 Samuel. Uh, so in, in 1 Samuel 17, look at verse 28. The scripture says there, And Eliab, uh, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the men, David's out on the battlefield, and he's identifying you know, Goliath, and he see, he's seeing the Goliath defy the armies of God, and he's out there trying to figure, we've got to do something about this. Everybody else sort of standing around, nobody's going to go fight Goliath. So in verse 28, Eliab, uh, David's eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? Why are you even here, David? Obviously, this was a phrase that depicted David not only as the least likely candidate to be the king, but unfit for battle. Unfit for battle. What his brother is saying is, you shouldn't even be on a battlefield, David. Isn't it something? And it goes on in verse 28, And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? <laughs> his brother even characterizes him as having a, a menial job. All he had to do was take care of a few sheep. And Eliab was even saying it in such a fashion that anybody could do that. You know, sort of expression we had where I used to work and says, well, you know, you can stand on your head and do that for a few months. Uh, so he didn't think what David was doing even really made a contribution to the family, much less to the army of God. And so, you know, who's keeping those few sheep that you left behind? So at the end of verse 28, I know thy pride and the haughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mayest see the battle. David, the reason you're here is because you're nosy. That's what he accused him of. Well, we know the story. David, David's attention was, was arrested because he saw Goliath defying the armies of God. He says, isn't there a cause here? Because he was a man after God's own heart. So look down to verse 33. Getting the characterization of David and what others thought of him. And that's how we know more about him. In verse 33, and Saul said to David, as we saw what his eldest brother said, in verse 33, what did Saul have to say? Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. You're not able. His brother's cutting him down as being a worthless fellow that can't even hardly take care of a few sheep. And the king, Saul's telling him, you're not able to do this, David. Just shut up and go home, right? And so he goes on to say, for thou art but a youth. And he, a man of war from his youth, who was Saul? Well, who was Saul looking at? He was looking at people. David was considering the cause. The, Goliath is defying God himself by defying his army. Nobody else seemingly took it to heart. <clears throat> what Saul didn't realize is God wanted somebody to stand up for God. He didn't need somebody that was a skilled warrior he just needed, because God's able to do anything, right? God just needed a willing body. And oh, by the way, David was just that. You don't have to be a somebody. God will make you somebody. And we don't do it to be made a somebody, but that's what God does, and we'll see more of that here. So look down to verse 55 in the same chapter. Verse 55, And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner... Whose son is this youth? Who is this guy? And he called him a youth. And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Nobody even knew who he was. His own brother knew who he was. But the rest of the foes, a big army out there. And Saul goes to his captain and says, Who is this young guy? Because he's going to go fight against Goliath. Abner says, I don't know who he is. They knew people by their father, if you will. And if you remember, we just read, this father seemingly didn't even think he was important. He didn't bring him forward to Samuel in order to be evaluated to be the king. He didn't think, consider David to be important enough for that. So in verse um, uh, 56 here, And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. And that simply indicates his youth and his inexperience is immaturity and everything else that would be demeaning uh, 
uh, by way of his character and capabilities. But we know the story. We've read it. We've studied it. And we know what happened there. So the son of Jesse, uh, David, was very, had very humble beginnings because he was a humble servant. Now, in, um, it says there, when I go back to our text verse in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, uh, verse 21, excuse me, verse 1, chapter 23, it says, David, the son of Jesse, and then it goes on and says, and the man who was raised up on high. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel, just go back to chapter 7 and look at verse 8. And there it says, uh, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from among the sheep coat, those few sheep that he was keeping, I've taken you from your duties as the shepherd, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. It says, and I was with thee, whithersoever or wherever you, thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men who are in the earth. So he was raised up. He was exalted by God, taken out of the sheepfold, and made the king of Israel. He was exalted. He was lifted up. He was raised up. And that's what the scripture says when David speaks the first part of this psalm. Uh, who was raised up on high, uh, raised up to be the ruler, raised up to be the king, raised up, as we see there in chapter 7, to be victorious, and raised up to be a great name. Um, and a great name, uh, we can characterize this great name this way. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 calls him the Christ, calls Christ the son of David. Now that doesn't make David necessarily anybody, but identifies him as being one who was a humble and obedient servant to God, through whom in the line of Judah, Christ came, as Matthew goes into the genealogy of Christ. And he mentions, he introduces that whole section by identifying Christ as the son of David. That's a great name, isn't it? Uh, God didn't just choose anybody. It's like Mary, we don't worship Mary. But God chose Mary uh, to, to, to bring Christ into the world. God chose David to be the first in a long line of kings that God would use to bring the Messiah, the anointed king, to reign on earth for a thousand years. And uh, so if we take a look at, uh, and I'm not going to turn to Matthew 1, 1, but 17 times in the New Testament, Christ is called the son of David. That sort of makes it a great name, doesn't it? We don't worship David. We just point at his obedience. Thank God for that. Now, I will look at uh, James chapter 4 and verse 10. James 4 and verse 10, a passage that perhaps many or most of you may have committed to memory. But in James 4 and verse 10 about being raised up, um, James wrote, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Saul lifted himself up. And, he, and when Saul was made king, he didn't want to do anything different than to be the king. It didn't matter what God wanted. And then while you're over there, 1 Peter, which we studied not long ago, um, just a few weeks ago, chapter 5 and verse uh, 6, the scripture says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So we see that that's what God does to his children. He will raise them up. You take a look at Stephen, the martyr. Uh, God raised up his name and gave him a name as a great name because he was faithful and just. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And he lived righteously and he preached the gospel. He died for the gospel. And his name is recorded uh, forever within the scriptures uh, because of his obedience to God. So... Uh, literally, he was raised up as well. Now, <clears throat> back to our text in 2 Samuel 23, 1. Not only was he the son of Jesse, of, of very humble beginnings of, from the farmer there, and the man who was raised up on high, raised up to be the king of Israel, the king, oh, by the way, through whom the covenant was given, the Davidic covenant. 
The fulfillment, of course, would have been Christ and will be Christ when he comes to reign on earth during the millennial kingdom. But also, after being raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob. The anointed of the God of Jacob. Now, this word anointed is also uh, the word that means Messiah. That's what the word means. Uh, And anointed, um, if you will, simply means that he's chosen, he's set apart, he's consecrated, if you will. And that's what we see here. So he was set apart uh, to be the king. He was set apart to be the ruler of the nation of Israel. So his office and his function was designed and determined by God. And God anointed him to that position. And we, uh, we can see that again if we go uh, back to 1 Samuel 16. And look at the couple verses following the ones we had looked at. If you look at verse 12 in 1 Samuel 16. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy of a countenance, uh, of a beautiful countenance and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he, that is the king. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, if you will, or onward. And um, so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And, oh, by the way, I I didn't mention that in the earlier part, as we read over there where the, the other sons had come and they were paraded before Samuel, there was a big feast going on and all the other sons of Jesse were at the feast. David wasn't even invited to the feast. He had to keep the sheep, the few sheep back in the wilderness. So we go back to our text. We see there that he was the anointed by God. God chose and appointed him to be the king. And oh, by the way, it happened at a time when Saul was already king But Saul wasn't the king that God chose. Saul was the king the people chose. And they prayed long and hard enough and bugged God enough. God gave them what they wanted, a king like other kings. And that's what he turned out to be. But David was a man after God's own heart. And that was God's chosen king through whom uh, Christ would come, um, being called the son of David. Now, lastly, in uh, chapter 23 in verse 1. Of our text, he says he, he calls himself here and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The word sweet means pleasant, and the word psalm means a song or a, or a psalm. Uh, David, as we know, he he sang uh, the music, he wrote the music, and he performed the music on instruments. He was a musician, and God gifted him that way, and God used him to write 73, at least that many have been attributed to him, of the Psalms in the book of Psalms plus this one. And they are all songs. And you've heard some of these put to music. Uh, They should probably all be put to music. But he is the sweet psalmist, the the pleasant musician, if you will, the pleasant um, songster. And if you remember, um, uh, we studied in 1 Samuel how that When Saul got really angry, remember he moved David over to his house after David had defeated the Philistine. Uh, Saul had David come to his house. And when Saul got really angry, he had David play on his instrument. It soothed his nerves and and his, his anxieties and he calmed down. And it was that kind of a soothing sense of it was uh, it was literally spiritual music because it was it was originated by God and he, and he was enabled by God to perform it and to write it. Now we move on and back to our text to verses two to two to four, <clears throat> and David being the humble servant in verse one, David now being the useful servant in verses two to four, the useful servant, and. Uh, This is divided in two parts, uh, that which characterizes him as useful, and then the requirements of other servants who would rule. So let's take a look at verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke, and this is is what he said. The end of verse 1 says, the sweet psalmist of Israel said. And so here's what David said um, in verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was in my tongue, The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. Now, we'll just take all of that. And uh, what David's saying here is he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the Psalms. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write 
uh, the book uh, First and, and Second Samuel, and um, of course to, to write this. But what we see here is a uh, is a a forerunner of what we have over in uh, Second Peter. If you look at Second Peter, uh, we just started our study over there, but we're not into the end of chapter one yet. But if you look at Second Samuel, excuse me, Second Peter. Get my books mixed up here. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, Peter wrote this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Uh, private means it's not of one's own doing, uh, whether it was the prophets or, or any other person. It's not of their own doing, and the word interpretation there means an origination. So what it really means is it did not originate from the individual. No prophecy originates from an individual. So in verse 21, for the prophecy came not uh, uh, in old or at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God, David being one of those, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so David, long before Peter ever wrote this passage, said the same thing. Now, if you look back at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, uh, we'll see another um, wording that gives us the same sense. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, Hebrews 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and in uh, diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers, David being one of those, uh, by the prophets... Um, and that is simply revelation that God gave directly uh, to the prophets and the men of God, and David being one of those. So God spoke directly to David. As we look at our text, verse 2, it says, The Holy Spirit of God spoke by me. That is, He breathed those words for me. They're not mine. It didn't come from David. It didn't originate with David. It didn't come from the will of David. It came by the will of God through the Holy Spirit as God inspired him to write those words. And David says that God's word was in my tongue, literally in my mouth. My speech was the speech of God. And then in verse 3, the first part, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He spoke to me. So God did speak to those in the Old Testament. He doesn't speak today as uh, Hebrews 11, excuse me, Hebrews 1, 2 would say that he speaks to us through his word today. Now, so we see this, that David was a useful servant in that he was the, he was the vessel of honor that God used to deliver his messages. He was the vessel of honor that God used to rule the kingdom of Israel. He was the vessel of honor that God used to show how God's servant would would behave and conduct themselves when they are persecuted and tormented and treated like an animal and hunted like a dog. And that was David. And he was the instrument of God, the instrument of righteousness for God's usefulness. So he was a man after God's own heart who performed God's will. It doesn't mean he didn't make mistakes. We know that he made mistakes. And there are several chapters that we just got finished studying in 2 Samuel about the evil that would come upon David's house because of the sins that he committed. And oh, by the way, the sins aren't finished yet. We'll see at the end in the next uh, chapter in uh, 2 Samuel, the last chapter of the book, how that uh, David sinned even again. But the Holy Spirit spoke by him. God's word was his speech and God spoke to him. Now... The the next part of this, in the end of verse 3 through verse 4, we see the message that God gave through David concerning anybody who is in a position of authority. Particularly, this was given to David as a ruler or as a king. And so it specifically was designed for any person who would be the leader of a country. But even more generally... We can apply it to anyone who has a leadership responsibility. And so at the end of verse 3, we see this message to rulers. And the first is, uh, in the middle of verse 3 there, He who ruleth over men must be just. Must be just. The word just there means right. Must be right. We can call it righteous. Uh, Now, what does this mean? Must be. 
must be of good moral character and of something we don't see much of in our nation today by those in positions of leadership, integrity. That's what it means. It means to be, must be. It says, Scripture says, he who ruleth over men must have integrity. What is it, just uh, Shepherdsville mayor arrested yesterday uh, for some wrongdoing? Lack of integrity. Uh, and, and the corruption goes, I mean, we saw it in Virginia where we live, and everywhere we've gone. Cleveland was a, was a bad place. They all got arrested for something. But Michigan was one of the worst. Even se- since we left Michigan, the mayor of Detroit was arrested on corruption charges. And, and, and Missouri was no different when we lived there. Wherever we've lived, it's there. When I was down in Louisiana working down there, some, the mayor... The, the mayor before the mayor that's there now, he was arrested for corruption charges. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And oh, by the way, uh, people complain and they, they vote for somebody in the, they vote somebody in the office and they don't do what they voted them to go in for, and they say, well, they didn't do that. Well, they may not have had intention to do that. You got to think about how do people get into office? A president's office, vice president office, and our, our, our state government, our local governments. How do they get there? They get elected. Who, we, who, who votes for them? So, you know, I, I learned a lesson through all the years that I worked um, in a union environment. All of my life I worked in a union environment. And every one of the union leaders had to get voted into their position. Brother Dave understands that, being one himself. <laughs> but I tell you one thing you don't find that's very common. In fact, it's, I think in, uh, uh, there are probably some rare circumstances where there are people that have integrity that get actually elected into a position. But I believe on a wide scale basis like what we have in our country and our state and our local governments, Say, well, I sure wish there was a Christian running for office. Who, who is it that seems to be the front-running candidate for the Republican Party now? A guy who builds and owns casinos, right? Is this the guy you want as a Christian? You know, number one, we got to vote. We have to vote. We have to vote. And sometimes you got to look at it like voting for the the... Yeah, <laughs> the least evil of the two. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what you have to look at it like sometimes. But unless, unless God be their God and their intent to serve Him uh, with, with, with a righteous view, they're not going to be there. People get voted into office. And so they do what they need to do in order to get voted in. I, there, you know, you can w- watch all the debates. Watch all the debates. I'm not going to talk about parties. Just watch all the debates. It doesn't matter what party they're in. They never say, you never hear a candidate saying, I can't do that, I won't do that, as far as what the people want. Oh, yeah, there'll be one party saying, well, we're not going to do what they're doing, and we're not going to do what they're doing, but oh, by the way, they're not doing that, but they're going to do something that's better. Ask any political candidate, can, what are you going to do, by the way? I can fix it. I can fix anything. I'll fix everything. We're going to put America back on the right track. They've been saying that since George Washington, I guess. And America's still not on the right track. Because they run for a vote. David was a king. But you know, it doesn't matter if you get voted in or if God puts you in there. And if you're a Christian, and well, let's put it this way. So you have, an, you have an opening for a pastor at a church. Brother, Brother Jim knows what I'm talking about. You have an opening for a pastor at a church. So you, 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 uh, you put the word out that we have an opening. So the pulpit committee does. So they'll get, you know, 15, 20, 40 different resumes. Guess what every one of them says? <laughs> I'm the man God wants in your pulpit. Well, only one of them 
if one of them can be right. Only one. Because God's not going to call six people to the same pulpit. So, you know, people send resumes in. Uh, resumes, what you th- know, something else, as being in HR for 35 years in, in a Fortune 500 companies, I've never seen anybody put in a resume things they can't do. They don't do that. They tell you all the great things they can do, all the wonderful things they can do. And what I found, because here's what I do when I look at a resume and I get somebody in and be able to interview them, I pick certain things out of the resume and say, okay, so you saved the company $2 million. Tell me specifically what you did as an individual to save $2 million. And what always comes out is, well, it was a team effort. It was So they lied about it on a resume. That person doesn't get hired. You're taking credit for something you didn't do. I don't, I don't hire those people. I'd rather have somebody that doesn't have the credentials and has integrity and somebody that doesn't have integrity and has all these credentials. The thing is, we have to have integrity if you're going to lead people. The scripture says, middle of verse 3, He who ruleth over men must be just. You must have integrity. You must have good moral character. It's required. That's the first requirement listed. The second one regarding ruling is ruling in the fear of God. That's with reverential fear of God. You know what people are, uh, that, that run for office or people that are in authority are afraid of? Other people. They're not afraid of God because God doesn't walk in the door of their business or their organization or church or whatever it is. He doesn't walk in there and contend verbally with you in a physical form. That's why people aren't afraid of God. They just ignore God, and they go on about doing their business. But they worry about all those people there. And specifically, if you are in an elected position, and you don't make people happy, you're a one-term ruler, right? You're only going to be there one term if you're not making people happy. So then, who do they bow down to? Special interest groups? That's why we see abortion being legalized. That's why we see homosexual homosexual marriages being legalized. It's why we see all of these things, you know, going forward that shouldn't be. Because what happens is the mass, the the last statistics I saw was 60% of the people in America are tolerant and supportive of homosexual marriages. So there is a party that is for homosexual marriage. And oh, by the way, the, the president gets to appoint the Supreme Court judges, justices, with, if you will, confirmation hearings, and I understand all of that. But you get, you get the pick. You get to pick. And so you pick people who lean in the same direction you do, so when they get to make these decisions, the decisions come out in favor of, their, of your constituency. Rulers rule in an evil manner all too often. There's, there's a lack of integrity in the authority over us. We understand that. It shouldn't be that way. But you have to have integrity and not just that. You have to have a fear of God, not a fear of the people who voted you into office, not a fear of the majority of the people who have an opinion, not the fear of any of that. Uh, and especially these special interest groups. Um, but... Rulers go after what's popular, what's trending, and, and what people will tolerate. Even I've seen business decisions made because most people want that. Because most people want that. So, for instance, I'll give you a good example. So the leader of Target, whoever the, whoever the president and CEO of Target is, what did they do recently? They said, because they're a company that wants to be on the leading edge, that they're known for that. They're well known. It didn't just happen. They, they want to be on the leading and cutting edge of everything. They want to be the least, they want to be seen as the leader. So when this whole thing on the homosexual and gay marriage caught on, they said, okay, there's these no gender bathrooms. We're going to take it another level. So now they don't have boy toys and girl toys they don't have boy clothes and girl clothes they have toys they have clothes they took down all the references to gender in their stores now you know what i'm not going to go into the store to verify it 
I've heard it, and I've heard enough of it, and I've seen enough evidence of it. And I don't need to go in there and give them my business or to verify that it's actually there, but it's well reported that that's a fact. And somebody in authority knows that 60% of America is in favor of it. And oh, by the way, it's trending towards a greater number. Let's get on the cutting edge and let's get the masses in here. That's where they're going to be. You, you, have to, you have to respect, as a, on the other side of the equation, you have to respect uh, the owner of Chick-fil-A who doesn't open their doors on Sunday. Amen? And you know, every time I drive up to a Chick-fil-A, it's different than any other fast food experience. As soon as you get there, uh, they say, it's a great day here at Chick-fil-A. Uh, how may we serve you? And, you know, it's just, and I don't care what you do. If you, if you got the wrong food, you turn it back. Well, thank you very much. And they're just so, they're so sensitive and caring like nobody else is. And I know, and I've, I've told my family, I know, and they know it already, but it's, it filters down from the top of the organization. There's integrity in the organization. I'm not saying the man's perfect or the woman, whoever's running it, I think it's a man. I'm not saying he's perfect. But I believe that he's got this uh, in, in his bailiwick, and that is he has integrity and he has a fear of God and not of man. So when they came out and there was a big opposition about homosexuals toward them, they didn't cow down to them. They stood their ground. All these folks are going to boycott them. Let them boycott. We're going to keep selling chicken sandwiches. <laughs> right? Amen. And, uh, and they are, by the way. And they're building more stores and they're still growing. But if you do it God's way, you do it the right way, you're going to be victorious. That's what God told Joshua. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. You stay straight with the Lord. Be just. Have integrity. And then God will make your way successful. And that's what he did until they, got to, until they got to the first camp at Jericho. Somebody stole the spoil. But he fixed that. And, and he did it the right way. We need to have rulers today that are like that. And then uh, in verse 4, it also says not only should it be just and should he fear God, but it says um, in, in verse 4, I'm sorry, and he shall be as the light of the morning even, uh, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Well, there's one thing that, uh, you know, Brother Danny's not here, but any farmer would know that you've got to have the sunshine and you've got to have the rain if you're going to be fruitful and productive. And so it's, it's, that, it's that character of an individual that demonstrates in the light, I'm sure, is representative of God being the light. That is the truth. And, and the water being like the nourishing of God, that, that the sunlight and the rain causes uh, an effective production of fruit and not briars or thorns, as we see uh, in verse 6 in the middle. But good leadership will provide effectiveness in the operation, and it will ensure productivity and increase in the organization if you do it the right way. But people don't want to do it the right way because they're afraid of what people are going to do, and they're fearful of what might happen. Christians walk by faith. Christians walk by faith. So we should walk by faith. But like rain and sunshine produce useful fruit, so a good ruler will be effective and productive, doing it with integrity and with the fear of God. Now, the last part of this, um, in verses 5 to 7, I call it David the blessed servant. So David the humble servant, David the useful servant, in these last three verses, David the blessed servant. In verse 5, Although my house is not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he maketh it not to grow. Um, uh, now, the, these, these are more conducive to questions than statement in this particular verse. And what David is, is really saying is, my house is right like the, like the rulership should be that's described at the end of verse 3, or excuse me, at the end of verse 3, that 
my, my house is aligned with that. And uh, there are many, and I've, I've seen it consistently in translations, um, that the, the, the original language, the Hebrew, is more conducive to questions here, and it, it may read well, truly is not my house right or, or so with God, so being like verse 4. Uh, excuse me, like verse 3, and that is being, having integrity and ruling in the fear of God. And you know that David had integrity. Now, yeah, he sinned, but nobody has sinned less. But you know he had integrity when he had two opportunities to take Saul's life, the one who was chasing him and hunting him down to kill him. And David says, no, I'm not going to touch God's anointed, because at that particular time, Saul was the king of Israel. And David says, I'm not going to take it upon myself to do that. That's God's responsibility. Now you see, somebody who's not trusting in God, somebody who fears man, if you're fearful of Saul, you're going to, and that's what David's soldiers were. They wanted him to go take him right then because they were afraid Saul was eventually going to get him. David trusted God. And he just simply said, that's God's job. That's not mine to do that. So Saul will fall when God's timing comes to pass. And he did. But not until then, by David's will. So uh, David's simply saying here, my house uh, is not so with God. We know that David's house was one because he was the one through which God had established the covenant. And truly isn't my house that way. And, um, and it goes on to say, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure ordered and of course assured if you will um or secured uh whichever way you want to say that uh in every part uh, because in, uh, he says an everlasting covenant and we know that's true over in uh, chapter 7 of second samuel uh verses like 11 through 16 and we studied that in fact we've studied that section of scripture twice through our study here i'm not going to go back again today but that everlasting covenant that's fulfilled in christ uh, that the the lineage through david would be a line of kings that would never and christ is the everlasting king and so the strict fulfillment of that uh, ends in christ or continues with christ because he never ends right it continues in christ so you could almost say has he not made me uh, an everlasting covenant arranged and secured in every part. And then uh, the third phrase there it says, as the tender, excuse me, third phrase there, um, for this is all my salvation and all my desire. So literally, um, will he not bring, if you will, fruition to my salvation? That is literally deliverance, but because salvation is typically deliverance in the Old Testament, but uh, the ultimate salvation. Uh, that's afforded in the New Testament and is afforded by our inheritance in heaven. We're saved out of this world and separated from the world, and we spend an eternity with our Father. And the last phrase there, um, and all my desire says, although he maketh it not to grow, literally, uh, if you will, that he intends it to grow. And won't God make it grow, is what he's really saying there. So he is truly blessed. And he talks about the blessings. In verse 6, he contrasts the blessings that he's received, uh, particularly through the everlasting covenant, because the family of David was the, was, was the family through which Christ would come. And he was looking at the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant as being the Messiah who would come. And that was his heart's desire. Uh, it wasn't that he would be the king. And that his son Solomon would be the king. It's that God would work through the lineage as he had promised to eventually bring the king who would reign forever. Amen to that. But the contrast is found in verses 6 and 7 where he talked about those evil rulers, if you will. But the sons of Belial, and that's a phrase that in our language today would mean worthless or base people, if you will. So these people shall be all of, all of them as thorns thrust away. Because when you harvest your crop, you can't market the thorns. You're not going to eat them, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're burned up because they cannot be taken with hands. They're too sharp. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll damage your hands and cause injury. And uh, that's, in fact, what the evil rulers do. 
Uh, they are destructive, and they bring destruction upon the people. In verse 7, but the man who shall touch them must be fenced with iron. In other words, you got, if you're going to handle these evil rulers, you've got to have some protection, the protection of God, no doubt, and the staff of a spear. And they, that is, these evil rulers, these uh, sons of Belial, or these worthless men, they shall be, at the end of verse 7, they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. Uh, the judgment of God upon the ungodly is what we're seeing there. And they have the fate of Revelation 21 at the end there when it talks about being cast into the lake of fire. And uh, that is eternal torment uh, in hell with fire burning and never destroying the body. I can't imagine what that would be like. The worst I've had by way of fire is a flash in the face one time. And I tell you what, they got my attention. And a flash is a whole lot different than an eternity of fire. I do know that. But I have, uh, I've had the opportunity once to go into a hospital uh, uh, intensive care unit where they had a person who was, who was in a bubble because their body had been so severely burned almost all over. And the person wasn't even able to talk. And uh, that person's relative asked me to go in and talk to him. And I said, is the person saved? And he said, we don't know. And it was somebody that I worked with. And it was just, you know, one of my fellow workers at work. And they asked me to go see uh, their relative. And I went in. And uh, that was the most difficult hospital visit I think I've ever had. A person who can't respond in any way to you. But looking at the person and constantly had a person so heavily medicated, but in constant pain, even at that. Uh, being burned almost over the entire body. And I don't even know if the person was conscious, but I said, Lord, you know whether the person's conscious, and I'm just going to do what you tell me to do, and that is I'm going to give them the gospel message. And then uh, I'll just pray that you will give them an understanding of what they need to do. And I don't know what happened with that. The Lord knows. I don't need to know. Uh, when you do the Lord's will, you don't have a need to know. We plant, we water. But we don't bring forward the increase. God does that. So I laid it out there for God to bring the increase. And I don't know if, if, whether he did or not. Um, I don't even know if the person's still alive today. Um, but what we do know is people, regardless if you're a ruler or not, if you're not saved by the grace of God, uh, you're going to spend an eternity in the lake of fire. And it's not going to be a pretty picture, as I've heard, as I've said many times before. But... Um, you know, David was a man after God's own heart, and he wrote this psalm uh, as one who, by experience, knew the ups and downs of living a godly life. The ups and downs, um, he had consequences come because of his sin that none of us have ever seen. Um, and, uh, and he knew, and I believe that when you have a, uh, David had a tremendous amount of responsibility. God's chosen people... God's chosen nation, God's chosen king. That's pretty serious. That's about as serious as it gets. And David failed seriously a couple of times. And there were tremendous consequences for that. Uh, but through it all, David came out with integrity. I believe he maintained his integrity throughout because when Nathan pointed a finger at him, he confessed his sin, as recorded in Psalm 51. He had a heart of repentance and uh, contrition. But David was a man who had integrity. David was a man who feared God. That's why he challenged. He didn't fear Goliath. He feared God. And when we, when we fear God, we won't fear the Goliaths in our life. We won't cow down to the opposition. You know, if you're, if you're in a gathering of a hundred people and you're the only one that believes uh, the way God believes, the way God wants you to believe, that's okay. Stand your ground. 99 people might get saved. Amen? <laughs> we, we cut God short because we don't have any confidence. Well, the confidence is not in us. Confidence is in God. And those are about the same odds when David went against the Philistine. By no human rationale could he have ever won that battle. None. No chance. Just like all everybody told him. There's no way possible you can win that. But truly, when, when God is for us, as Paul wrote in Romans, who can be against us? Not even the Philistine, right? 
and not our, not our Goliaths either. They can't be against us. Let's stand for prayer if you will. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We lift up your name tonight, the name above all names. And Father, we, we come to give respect. We come to give praise. And we have come to worship you. We've come before your word with hearts that are intent to learn and then to put to practice that which we learn. So, Father, may we, may we act with integrity in all of our doings and may we never fear man or man's devices or plans. May we always have that reverential, refear, or reverential fear and respect for, for you giving obedience to your word and being submissive to your will. And Father, we pray for the leaders in our country, whether they be at a national or a local level or anywhere in between. We pray for the leaders of corporations. We pray for anybody in leadership position, for all of them, Father. We ask, Father, that you would give us courage to, 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 to live and to speak the truth as you've declared it here. And that others would do the same. We pray that many of our governmental leaders, uh, even those who are candidates for presidency in our nation, Father, they'd be saved by the grace of God. And they would operate in accordance with that salvation, being just and fearful of you. We'll give you thanks and praise as you work in our midst, even with respect to that. And now, individually, as we make our way home, we ask for your safety. Uh, that it would be provided in fullness, and you'd make every provision for each one here. Father, honoring all these requests that have been given, yet we submit to your will in each one. We give you thanks and praise for all that you do, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.